Hello and welcome to History Hack. Today we are back with hedge hopping and just as a personal note to start I want to say thanks for everyone putting up for my unexpected absence from the show but we have lined up a fantastic guest and in light of the sort of question I put out on Twitter a little while ago about expanding um, the scope of the show we're going to actually be running for quite a period of time in today's episode because today I'm delighted to say we're joined by Stephen Little, who is an aerodynamicist for an upside down airplane company during the day, but more valid for our conversation at the moment. He's one of the trustees of the Vulcan to the Sky Trust, which looks after Avro Vulcan XH558 and who returned it to the skies for a few glorious years um, recently. And to show my age, I remember watching her in the early 90s. So there we go. That's making everybody feel old. But anyways, we're going to talk about the journey Avro took from an aircraft like the Anson in the 30s to basically the sci-fi Vulcan in just about a decade and a half. So we're going to cover a lot of ground, but it should be pretty exciting. So Steve, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much, Mark, for having me. Well, we, we, we better do the usual check-in. You've just had the Lurg. So how has lockdown been and then having the Lurg after all the lockdowns? Yeah, frustrating. I thought I'd made my way through it without, I thought I'd escaped, but but sadly not. Yeah, I, I can't argue with what happened in, in lockdown, really. From my, my perspective, I completely got away with it compared to how the, the problems that other people had. So yeah, I, I cannot argue at all. But yeah, unfortunately, quite recently had my dose of, I guess it must have been Delta, it was pre-Omicron. So appropriate or not. Yeah, yes, very. So let's ask the question, how did you get involved with XH558? So I suppose the answer to that is I always wanted to be, and then eventually I, I found a way. So I grew up close to Finningley, where the aircraft is based now. So I remember seeing her in the 80s, in fact, when, when I was a kid. So even before you did. And I, I always loved the Vulcan, even in comparison to you know the, the newer fast jets that you'd see at, at the air show. I always thought it was amazing. And my dad and I built an Airfix model when I was probably five or six. So again, in, in the early 80s, I wanted that rather than a tornado. It was I was fascinated by this enormous noisy machine and obviously very disappointed in the early 90s when she was grounded. So that's another thing I can remember quite vividly, the, the final appearance at Finningley in 1992. So I would have been probably 13, 14. And it was the first time I'd ever sneaked into an enclosure in our show. So I was right right next to the runway where she ran up and that was that was amazing. So a very vivid memory. And eventually, because I was fascinated by aircraft and, and engineering in, in general, I went to I went to university in Manchester, which is obviously the closest big city to Avro and where Avro started out. And there were lots of references to to Roy Chadwick as someone who had the, the, well, the ultimate designer of the Vulcan or the original designer of the Vulcan and the time that he'd spent in the city. And so, so ultimately, I, I went down a path to become an aerodynamicist. And I've kind of spent the past 20 or so years involved in that field. But I was kind of, when you're working in academia, there's quite often opportunities or this time or this encouragement to go and go out and do other things. And I was involved or I became involved with the Royal Aeronautical Society and eventually became a, a trustee of that, a council member. And I was, it so happened, I was at a dinner where Robert Fleming, who the, the former chief executive of, of Vulcan to the Sky, happened to be there as well. So I, I went over and gave him a pitch and explained that I knew all about charity governance and I knew all about aerodynamics and I knew all about Vulcans. And eventually they decided that they really did need some new trustee, trustees. And I became the guy who brought down the average age in the room, really. I think that was my contribution. And that was back in 2011. So I can't claim any credit for getting the aircraft back into the air, but I was obviously deeply involved with the the running of the charity during the the second half of the flying phase and for my sins what has happened since we'll come back to that later <laughs> I, I i i remember seeing it at, at big in i think 91 92 that last the farewell thing and my memory is the ground literally shaking on a touch and go and then everything being delayed because the touch and go was such a touch and go. She'd put a groove in the runway. <laughs> <laughs> oh. ah, the, 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 the good old days. But let, let's get cracking. Let, let's kick off with Avro itself because it's an utterly fascinating company, which was there at the, at the dawn of flight in, in Mr. A.V. Rowe himself. But do you want to give us just a quick pre of what Avro was and what happened to her in, in the 30s, which brings me into my wheelhouse a little bit 
Yeah, I thought we might come in the, the hooker direction. I'm not at all surprised by that. So, so A.V. Rowe himself, Elliot Vernon Rowe, he was the first British person to fly a British designed aircraft in this country and started his engineering company to build aircraft in, I think, Great Ancoat Street in Manchester, which is not far from where I went to university again. So this is back, obviously, in the 1900s, immediately pre-war. And they Avro found themselves in a position where obviously lots of aeroplanes were required quite quickly. And the famous Avro product of this time is, is the 504 trainer, of which thousands were built. One of the things that they did was invent a turnbuckle system for the rigging of biplanes. And actually, when immediately post-war, when there were thousands of surplus aeroplanes and it wasn't really necessary to build any new ones, they the royalties from that and also from A.V. Rowe's patents on control systems for aircraft. So he may have been the first person to connect two axes on a joystick and he was able to, to patent some of that as well. So it it's, it's often difficult to understand when aircraft are not being built, how some of these companies survived, because clearly in the 20s, there weren't anything like as many aeroplanes being built. But it's Avro in particular were able to exploit those patents, but ultimately it wasn't enough. And in terms of what happened to the company, John Sidley, who was a great industrialist and the second half of the Hawker Sidley name, was able to buy a very large shareholding in Avro. He was well capitalized at a time when Avro wasn't. And that meant in the mid-1920s, the company was largely taken over by what ultimately would settle down as being the Armstrong Sidley, Armstrong Whitworth conglomerate. So uh, ultimately, the control is lost by A.B. Rowe, and, and he ultimately leaves the company and forms what will become Saunders Row on the Isle of Wight. So ironically, the, some of their final products are some of the sort of rocket-powered interceptors that would ultimately have shot down the Russian equivalents of the Vulcan had they ever come to fruition. So A.B. Rowe kind of leaves the field himself, having set up this company in Manchester. It's now moved out to Woodford, a much larger place in, in the country with the space to, to build lots of aeroplanes. But also what's happening in the meantime is that John Sidley effectively merges his Armstrong Sidley empire with Vickers Armstrong, but then is able to buy back much of the aircraft interests in that. And then in 1935, I believe, he decides he's going to retire. So ultimately he sells that conglomerate to Hawker, who similarly in the background have become a well-capitalized company who are doing quite well, they bought out Gloucester. So you've got Gloucester, Hawker, Armstrong, Whitworth, Avro, all these companies are now together in, in one place. And ultimately, they've got the, the Hawker Sidley Holdings company logo over the top. It's not really used at the time. It will become, it'll become used much later. And in fact, it, it, to my mind, it's something that you do associate with a, a large merger that takes place at the time of the consolidation of the British aircraft industry in the, early, in the late 50s, early 1960s. But really, it's, it's there all along. And they're able to use their industrial capacity to subcontract to each other when, when one of them has a good design that works and is being sold. But predominantly, they're operating quite autonomously and quite independently, which sometimes seems quite odd. They sometimes seem to be competing for the same contracts. But actually, it does seem to work in this period, particularly coming up to World War II, when there's just simply a requirement for capacity. We simply need to build aeroplanes, whatever they are almost. Yeah, because that I always find that little sort of triumph of Avro Gloucesters and, and Hawkers quite amusing because Gloucesters get the Gladiator contract because the Air Ministry don't want to give Hawkers another fighter, so they give it to Hawker Sidley anyways. It, it's, it's weird logic. But what, what we do have in the, the late 30s is the, the bomber always getting through idea, the rearmament's coming, and the the creation of what would become the strategic forces that you know would would dominate thinking really for the next 30, 30, 40 years. So to get to say the V-Force and the Vulcan later on, in the 30s, we've got Avro and Handley Page especially starting to look at bombers and big bombers themselves. So what is happening there? And for a company like Avro that's actually not building very big aircraft, how do you get from say, Anson to Manchester to Lancaster to Shackleton. What sort of permutations are they going through to scale up to that size of aircraft? Yeah, ultimately, it does seem a bit odd, really, in that Hanley Page, as you've said, uh, we are familiar with 
big bombers that they produce. So even in the First World War, they're building the biggest bombers that, that exist. And they effectively retain that expertise going forward. They're building airliners in, in the 1930s. So the, the HP-42, for example, that's familiar with us from that big biplane that Imperial Airways flew around the world very slowly. Yes, they clearly have that capability, whereas Avro don't necessarily have that. I guess the, the Anson is a case in point where it's built with a, a, a wooden wing, so the, the technology is not particularly new, but it is moving on. It's moved on from a configuration perspective. It's now a low-wing monoplane. It's not a stressed in fuselage, but at the same time, it's a useful point on the way, and they're going to build enough of them that they can carry on developing that technology and what happens in terms of the RF requirements and from the the bomber always gets through idea is that strategic bombers start to be developed so I, I know you went and looked at the, the Hampden built by Hanley Page up at the RF museum at Cosford that's being been restored there so that's an example of fairly high technology aircraft at the time so this is the mid-1930s and we now are in a stressed skin low-wing monoplane configuration and actually, it's quite a quick aircraft for the time. Armstrong Whitworth in the, the Hawker Sidley group will start building the Whitley, which is, again, it's, I think we look at it now and we think it's a fairly pedestrian design, but actually this is fairly cutting edge for the mid-1930s. It's just that the situation moves on very quickly. So by the start of the war, it's, it's not up to as much as we would like. And, and obviously, probably the most famous of the bombers at this time is the is Vickers Armstrong's contribution, the Wellington with its geodetic structure by Barnes Wallace. So aircraft are getting bigger. They're getting more like we would recognize as a real airplane. It's a, it's a stress skin structure to an extent. So that technology is developing, but not necessarily at Avro. What happens after that is that first generation of bombers that will go into the war are already being superseded on, on the drawing board by something that is much bigger. And so this is a specification B B-12-36, I think, which will eventually result in the Shaw Sterling. So contracts go out ultimately to Supermarine, which we don't see produced. They, they get as far as building much of it before it's bombed, but it's not the requirement. Whereas which, Shaw's, interestingly, is what Mitchell's spending most of his time on and yep. not the Spitfire, which people tend to forget. Absolutely, yeah. And it's a very strange aircraft when we look at it now with the design with the, with effectively the, the bomb load carried in a span wide across the central fuselage in the wings, which you see a bit on the Sterling as well, which is the aircraft that actually does get this contract. So it's a very large aircraft. It's ultimately, it's probably quite underpowered as the, as the case may be. And it won't prove to be as successful as the other very heavy bombers in World War II, because again, the situation moves on. But there's a second contract that comes out of this, which is another specification, P-1336, which is for what is an aircraft that will be smaller and will have a much more varied role. It will go around the empire, ultimately. That's where it's perceived as being important. And it will do things like torpedo bombing, and it will do things like keeping tribesmen in the right place, that kind of thing that the RF is traditionally involved in. It will transport troops. It will do various other things. And that's the basis of the, the aircraft that... Avro and Hanley Page are ultimately contracted to build. The famous thing about this contract is that it's everybody knows that it's supposed to be based around a brand new powerful engine from Rolls-Royce, the Vulture, that also falls down ultimately. That's not actually in the contract, but it's just that you need a very significant power density. So having this air, this engine with the with a potential for 2,000 horsepower in quite a quite a compact installation makes sense. So that's what both Avro and Hanley Page based their initial submissions around. What happens from an Avro perspective is that they don't have the experience of these fully metallic stress skin structures. And Roy Chadwick, the chief designer in the end, is, is quite circumspect about how it turns out. He realizes it's come out to be very heavy and he realizes he could have done, could have done a lot better. Another requirement is that that goes back to this idea the aircraft is very multi-role and has to carry torpedoes is that his aircraft has a very large unobstructed bomb bay and that will turn out to be absolutely critical to how this aircraft is used in the future so what transpires at the start of the war so this is now moved on to 1939-ish the avro manchester has its turned out this twin vulture powered aircraft is ready to um, fly from what is now manchester airport the first prototype actually has 10 feet shorter wingspan than will be required for even the second prototype. And it's very hard to get the thing in the air at all. And that's, again, results from this problem that Avro have, 
in producing a structure that is efficient enough from a weight perspective to fill the rest of the specification. Um, and what actually happens is the aircraft is considerably over strength, but it's also overweight, but they have no, no choice. Basically they have to increase the wingspan and they can do that actually quite easily because it's so strong. They can actually just spread out the wing ribs that they already have on the, the central section that's, that's effectively parallel. And so it's not too difficult for them to do that. So yeah, the, there's this very, in some ways, very innovative aircraft in another ways, sort of tragically compromised aircraft, the, the engines will never deliver enough power. So it, it doesn't really take advantage of this idea of very high power density, but critically the engines are fantastically unreliable. So when it does go to war, it's, it can't be trusted basically is the issue for the crews. Many of them will be lost through problems with the engines and it's not really delivering very much more than the earlier bombers. I, I need to find someone to talk about Vulture because it's it, it, it's one of those in, interesting engines. It's what, two peregrines basically bol bolted together up, uh, upside down each other. And there's uh, the Matt Bierman's article about propeller stall recently. It's absolutely fascinating. That it might have been the propellers because the Vulture that was in the Tornado test bed ran fine because it had a smaller prop. But maybe the 16-foot prop on the Manchester was the same problem that Heinkel had later. It was just shaking the damn thing to pieces. Wasn't there's... This could be apocryphal, but there was a gag that Manchester crews requested to be redesignated as infantry because they were barely flying because the aircraft was usually on fire. So yeah. it sounds about right, doesn't it? From what I've heard, yeah. There's there's also a quote that it's it's the the only the only engine test bed that has ever completed operational missions. It's the great miss, but it leads to arguably the the greatest success of of the company in 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 the Lancaster and. A lot more goes into it than just slapping another couple engines on it, isn't it? Because they look kind of similar. It's like, well, they just made the wing a little bit better, put a couple extra Merlins on it, and job done. But it's a very different aircraft, isn't it, from Manchester to Lancaster? Well, it is to an extent, but also it's in some ways it's literally the same. So the actual prototype Lancaster is literally a Manchester that's been taken off the production line and modified and it still retains the original triple fin configuration that the the early manchesters had so it looks quite odd to us but one of the things that again is happening in the background is this idea about pragmatism and standardization so rolls-royce have produced an installation for the merlin that can be put on different aircraft and one of the first ones that goes on is the bowfighter from bristol and so the actual the physical engine installations on the lancaster prototype are physically bowfighter nacelles it needs a longer wingspan to accommodate this and again they can simply stretch the the central section of, of the wing by increasing the the rib spacing and it means that it goes from i think it was originally 80 foot wingspan in the the prototype manchester they're now at 102 feet and i think they might go in further and from an aerodynamic perspective this is gold dust because it's increasing the aspect ratio and what that does with everything else the same basically is increase the lift to drag ratio and that is altitude if everything else is the same. Mm -hmm. So this aircraft suddenly, out of necessity, we think of it as being an engine change, but actually what it's done is it's aerodynamically, by necessity, made the aircraft much better anyway. So it's an, it's an interesting question that if the Vulture had worked, or if the Halifax had retained the Vulture ultimately to the end, the it might have been necessary to modify the Halifax aerodynamically in the same way, and that could have been as successful. The Halifax was always a much draggier aircraft than, than the Lancaster. So a re if, on an equivalent power, it could never provide the same performance. So it was always lower. It was always more likely to be taken down by flak or fighters. That, that's fascinating because wing, wings, we think of wings, big pointy things that, you know, that stick out and block your view when you're in the wrong seat on, on, on the airplane. From what you've just been describing there, these, what would seem to be subtle changes have these massive knock-on effects. How much of that would they know on the drawing board? Or would it be a case of they have an idea and then they have to wait till it be, and, until production to under, or to prototype to understand that would come out? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. And I think one of the things that's interesting about aircraft being designed at this time is now aspect ratio would be something we wouldn't necessarily, everyone on the street would understand, but certainly an aerospace engineer, a first year student aerospace engineer would understand the, the significance of that. It was quite a long time before those ideas um, permeated 
to the UK, actually. So the Germany tended to be ahead in the kind of fundamental research that was going on in the period of, let's say, up to the 1920s. And lots of the ideas came across at the start of the 1930s and, and started to permeate through the UK aerospace industry. So that they would have known at Avro that aspect ratio was very important, but it, they were heavily constrained by the weight problem. So simply adding more wing or adding a wing that was likely to um, need a stronger route to take the take the the bending loads of a longer wing being further outboard would have been very difficult for them to do. So they kind of looked into this approach where their aircraft was too heavy, but it was also too strong. And you could start trading that off. One of the reasons for the uh, a second reason, I guess, for the Manchester being too strong was that it was designed as a this very curious part of its specification where the air ministry didn't want to build any new runways. So what they said is we will, as aircraft get heavier, we will simply catapult them out of airfields. So it had to be incredibly <laughs> strong to be able to, to resist those loads. So all of that, they could kind of cash in after a while because those requirements would, didn't need to be met anymore. They could simply say, well, if we add some more stretches to the aircraft, then we will add some more wing and we will make it useful. I want to throw in another Hawker connection here because someone at Avro, who I've always found fascinating, is Stuart Davies. So he's sort of pinched from one part of the group to the other bit. And he's, you know, at, at, at Hawker's, he was the, the, the productionization man really for ramping up on hurricane he works quite closely with chadwick and becomes becomes sort of the man on what becomes the vulcan what about him is a good pithy 30 second bio of him yeah i mean he's obviously very important and he will become the technical director um of avro at the time when the vulcan is being created unfortunately roy chadwick will be killed in 1947 and so he starts the Vulcan project, but he, he doesn't really continue it. It's, it's Davis who will do that. So I must admit, I don't know very much about Davis's early life, but I do know that he was involved in the hurricane at Hawkers. And I think in about 1938, he moved over to Avro. The impression I always get of him is that he fitted in perfectly at Avro and he was able to drive in his own image almost. He strikes me as a very pragmatic engineer. And, and he understood that you needed to get product out of the door. And so the effort of productionizing things and making it possible to build them quickly was forefront in his mind. But also he, he understood the need for the technology to be right up there as well. So it was that almost perfect combination for what they were trying to do. There's a paper by him that I've read in which he describes the design office as production department number one. So effectively they're saying we are going to design or we are going to design for production from the start. And that's a very modern idea almost. But at Avro, they did that from this, in this period particularly. So the, the Manchester is built by carving it up into sections, into modules almost. They can be built all around the Avro group in different factories. So particularly they have a factory at Chaddington and a factory at Woodford where final assembly takes place in, in Manchester. And all the, the individual modules of Manchester and ultimately Lancaster and the, the successors are all taken there. There's quite... There are some well-known images that you'll see of Lancaster production where it's a big block of rear fuselages and there's another one where there's a you know, big block of noses, that kind of thing. And that's literally how they did it. But it wasn't by magic. It wasn't that just came to mind. It was someone thought about this. And that is ultimately why there were thousands of Lancasters and why they could build them in Chester and why they could build them in Coventry and, and all around the country. And they all fitted together. We know that Hawkers and, and Supermarine were, we'll call them volatile design officers from the nature of the men at the top. What was Chadwick's personality? Was he the, the anti-cam bit, bit, bit calmer or was he the same sort of guy that's come up through an engineering background and was shouting and cursing and swearing all the time? So I've read different things, but I, I do get the impression very much that he was a, a calmer individual than Cam might have been. Not but hard, I, really. Yeah, indeed. I, th I think these men are clearly of their time, aren't they? You wouldn't behave in these ways in an engineering environment today or any work environment today in the, <laughs> the way that they might have done. But I, yes, I, I wasn't there and I don't know enough about it, but I, I get the impression that he wasn't like Cam, shall we say. Which isn't a bad thing. <laughs> Let's get onto the maths because this is, we were chatting before and I've given talks where I've, I've thrown the word transonic in and everybody's gone, hmm, and nodded their heads. And I move quickly on because aircraft are getting faster Engines are becoming more powerful and we're starting to get towards the sound barrier. But before we get there, there's this um, transient area where a lot of interesting things are happening to airflow going over 
aerofoils, fuselages, things like that. And this is sort of the area where Vulcan is going to is going to live in its operational life. So, what is the transonic zone, and why is it sort of? I guess we we know why it becomes such a big thing in the Second World War, but can you sort of explain to an idiot like me what it is and what the impacts would be on, say, an, an aircraft as as big as the Lancaster? Fundamentally, transonic flow is one in which we have a local supersonic region. So your aircraft is an aircraft that is traveling subsonically usually, but over portions of its, of its surface, it will encounter localized supersonic flow. And so aircraft and wings, we're reasonably familiar with how they work. Basically, the air will arrive at the speed of the aircraft, but it will have to be accelerated around the wing. So if you're traveling close to the speed of sound, and you're going to accelerate that air a bit, it's going to end up supersonic, basically. And the principal problem is that subsonically, the air um, is traveling less quickly than the pressure waves will travel in it. So effectively, the air at any point on the wing knows what is going to happen because it can feel the pressure of the wing. It can feel the pressure of the air around it. If the flow is supersonic, then the flow is traveling more quickly than the pressure waves are traveling within it. And it doesn't know what to do next. It doesn't know what is going to, what is going to come up. So it can be expanded to be supersonically reasonably easily. There will be losses potentially associated with that. The problem comes is when it needs to slow down because there is subsonic air on the other side. And that can't happen in a gradual way because it doesn't know about it. Or it's as if it's hit a wall and the product that that occurs there is known as a a shock wave, which is a, a discontinuous change in the properties of the flow at a very defined point. So again, we've probably seen images of that kind of thing where on a fast jet and air show, for example, you will see the condensation that takes place in that region. And there's effectively, you can see that there's a discontinuity in the flow. It's the first time that kind of thing will be encountered. And ultimately, the problem with a shockwave initially is that it's very inefficient to have them on your aircraft. They're, they're very draggy. There's a, a change in pressure across there that isn't well looked after, if you like. You haven't optimized your aircraft to do something about that because people don't know how to do it yet. It's quite reasonable. And that's why nice, big, thick wings on things like Typhoon and Thunderbolt traveling at crazy speeds are encountering these sorts of things in odd profiles that are causing them to to suffer from flutter and, and things like that. Yeah, so the, the Typhoon's, I, th- I thought we might talk about this, but it- got to squeeze it in. Everyone has to drink. It's quite an interesting one in a number of ways, but because it, it has a subsonic pro- problem as in that it's not really appreciated in the 1930s, in the UK in particular, that as wings get thicker, there will be increasing um, losses due to, due to drag that will cause the, the lift-to-drag ratio to, to reduce. So they'll become basically less and less efficient. And it's almost, the, the problem is almost, it's almost like the the degraded state that you get on a thick wing from having quite a thick thick boundary layer. So the flow quote close to the aerofoil that effectively results in its wake and makes it appear thick thicker than it actually is to the air. Wings, when they're tested in wind tunnels, because of the turbulence that is encountered in wind tunnels in the 1930s, it appears like all wings have this problem, even thin wings. So the, the thing that isn't spotted is not that wings that are thick are inefficient, it's that wings that are thin are very efficient. So even in the subsonic sense, so this has nothing forming, the Typhoon starts out at a disadvantage because it has this 18% thick wing, which is at the root. It will get thinner towards the tip. But for example, if you were to take a Spitfire, the Spitfire's root thickness is probably less than the tip thickness of a Typhoon. And to an extent, Mitchell has looked into this one because he's got this empirical data that says from building the Schneider Trophy seaplanes where they found that thin wings go faster. And they're not really sure if it, it isn't in the academic record or it isn't in the, the body of knowledge yet quite why that is. And you can't necessarily go to a wind tunnel and identify why that is either. Even if you go to somewhere like NPL or you go to the Royal Aircraft Establishment, the tunnels are not yet good enough with low enough levels of free stream turbulence to be able to identify what that is. But on the Spitfire, they just thought well, we've seen that this works. We think it's important to have a very thin wing. And so they go all out to do that, and which results in a number of aspects. So it results in the fact that the ammunition boxes for the for machine guns have to be laid on the side, which means that the guns have to be spread out across the span of the wing, which ultimately leads them to a very long cord outboard 
which drives them towards the elliptical platform. So there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff in there that is uh, very clever empirical engineering. The background isn't necessarily good enough from a scientific basis, but engineers are going, well, we know that this has worked before and we haven't got very much time. So what we're going to do is we're going to take what we know and we're going to do the best job we can based on the limited information we have, which is very familiar. Because mm. it, it's, it's this fascinating period that the, the science and the development are sort of almost in a race, aren't they? That you've got... You know, the NACA producing the report, I think it was 1939 that Schmood then reads and puts on the shelf ready for, for P51, which comes way too late for the sort of first generation of modern fighters. But then you then immediately see in Mustang, FW190, all, all of those ones that, that come next. But as we go through the war, this sort of data is starting to become solidified. It's still a bit sketchy, I think it's, it's fair to say, by the end. But chaps like... Chadwick and everybody are looking to that next big leap. So let's start talking about that period because Avro are very much focused on just producing as many Lancasters as they possibly can. You've got Lancastrian, you've got York, you've got things like this, which are sort of bits of Lancaster with other bits put on it. So the, I guess the question is, how do we go from, say, Shackleton, which I once heard was a million rivets flying in close formation to something that's straight out of science fiction, like the Vulcan. What's that sort of journey from a traditional bomber to the Delta? Yeah, you have Hanley Page and Avro who will be ultimately successful in, in bidding for this contract. And they approach this in, in very different ways. So it might be interesting to start with where Hanley Page are at in the 1930s. So the Halifax, I think, is probably... You have to be, it's hard to say something nice about it almost in that it's like, I think. Be, I'm Canadian. Clearly yeah, most of our boys went to war. Not as good. Halifax. Not Go as on. good. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> but I think they would have preferred to have yeah, gone probably. to war in a Lancaster. Yeah. So it's an aircraft that ultimately I don't think we would regard as being the best that could be done, but it was under, uh, again, obviously under difficult circumstances. Whereas the Victor that they will produce is up there as one of the, the pinnacles of logy. So it's interesting that they have effectively this sort of very pragmatic aircraft and you wonder how they did make any of the leaps. And one of the answers is in the background, this they have this research department in the 1930s that's led, led by a man called Gustav Victor Lachmann, who is German. And he has, in fact, made a massive contribution to the success of Hanley Page because separately, both Hanley Page, Sir Frederick Hanley Page, as he will become, and Lachmann invent the slotted flap and they're able to patent that basically at, at the same time and a deal is ultimately done in which Lagman comes to the UK and is a consultant to Hanley Page and he works with him for, for many years and in the 1930s this as obviously the, the clouds of war start start to gather Lachman is looked on with increasing distaste by the air ministry and by MI5 and by various shades of officialdom, given that he frequently makes trips back to Germany and he's occasionally offered jobs in German universities and it's not the best thing for the security of the UK industrial base, if you like, the, the technology base that will be required to go and fight a war against Germany if Lachman can disappear back to Germany and explain to everyone what is going on. Um, so there's, there, there are very concerted efforts that go up to actually Secretary of State level to get rid of Lachman out of Hanley Page. But what he's actually doing is he's fascinated by several things. One of them is laminar flow. One of them, and it most significantly in this case, is the production of a tailless aircraft because he thinks that, that is a way of the parasitic problems that you encounter, be that weight, be that drag. So as aircraft are going faster and that's becoming more and more important, drag varies with the cube of the speed. So if you want to double your speed, you need eight times the power. So that's, that's, a, that's a really big deal. So he's trying to work out which bits of an aircraft he can cut off and the tail is the obvious one what he realizes is if you if you sweep back the wing that enables you to balance the aircraft longitudinally so you can get rid of the tail under those circumstances so there's a body of work that's taking place and they'll eventually go and build or a company called dart aircraft will go and build an aircraft called the manx which is a little demonstrator for this this idea um, that just about gets off the ground in the war but Lachman himself, on the outbreak of war, is carted off to prison, and then he's carted off to the Isle of Man for the duration. So he's he's taking he's not doing very much to be involved in this, but he's set the the wheels in motion for for the Hanley Page Research Department to look at 
effectively a swept wing aircraft, but for a different reason than the one that we're familiar with. So they're starting to design these big bombers. So they're talking about 60 or 70,000 pound gross weight aircraft, which compares with the heaviest Lancasters at, at the end of the war. And they're looking at the, the structure that you would require to build a large swept wing aircraft, but not yet for a, for the transonic aviation reason we'll associate with, with swept wings. And Lightman's problem is that he, he can't decide who's going to win the war to some extent, and he can't decide whether he's German or British, or fundamentally, he does decide that he is German and can't be disloyal to the government, whoever that is. And he, he also doesn't want to be associated with anything that might be used in the war. So he, he's interrogated and they say, well, you know, maybe there is something you can do. And he says, well, I, I don't actually want to build anything that might be used to bomb Germany. Meanwhile, you've got Hanley Page saying, well, I'd love to get him back because he's vital to our efforts to design combat aircraft and clearly that circle can't be completed it's either one or the other and so unfortunately Lightman stays on the Isle of Man for the, for the duration of the war and actually the MI5 are very keen to deport him somewhere it's not clear where he's going to be deported to at, at the end of the war but eventually Hanley Page gets him back and in the meantime Godfrey Lee who is the effectively inherits the research department has been very active on developing this tailless aircraft at the end of the war, goes to Germany and and has a look along with the rest of um, the UK officialdom in the aerospace industry at what Germany has been up to. And they discover that whilst they had suspected some of this in their work in the UK that is going on swept wings, the Germans are significantly ahead of this. And they understand that basically in a transonic flow where you, you, you want to avoid shot wakes forming and you want to avoid the issues that are associated with the supersonic flow, if you consider the flow that's effectively normal to the leading edge or a right angle to the leading edge, that's the stuff that does all the work. If you separate the flow into two components, so you've got one normal to the leading edge, one parallel to the leading edge, the one that's parallel will not be going through significant pressure changes. So effectively, that's the, the basis of a, a swept wing. You can rotate it about the, the aircraft's central axis, and it thinks that it's in a, a flow that is subsonic to an extent. So you're essentially de delaying the inevitable here because it's physics. It's going to happen, but yes. you're just trying to get as much out of it before it happens as possible. Yeah, indeed. And that sounds quite simple as a concept. And the problem is that in three dimensions, a shot wave will, will occur somewhere. There will be changes in how the wing is swept, no matter how it looks. If it, it might look like you've got a parallel leading edge and so all the isobars should line up across the wing, but it's got a tip and it's got a root. It's in three dimensions and things are going to happen across that span. That means that you will have problems somewhere first and that will seed a problem for the rest of the wing. So although it's quite a simple concept and it's actually dates back in as a matter of public record in, in the scientific literature to at least 1935 and the, the Volta conference where it's discussed, it's been largely forgotten because that wasn't the, the, there were no power units that could potentially make aircraft go that quickly anyway. So it's become to an extent irrelevant what has to happen in that very short period at the end of the war is people solve these problems of how you create an effective three-dimensional swept wing that works or a three-dimensional transonic wing of any kind that, that works so Hanley Page have got this idea for they've kind of done the groundwork if you forget why they're doing it but they've got a swept wing what they're then very concerned about is the fact that a swept wing will load its tips more than it will load its root. So effectively, the, the tips can see the rotation of the flow that's caused by the inboard region of the wing, which is obviously further ahead than the tips are. So they see air coming in a more inclined state, and they're, they're always more loaded. So it's going to stall anywhere. It's going to stall at the tip. And if an aircraft stalls at the tip, it's like pushing on a door. It will cause it to roll. And if that's unpredictable, the pilot won't be able to control it in time. So tip stall is a massive problem. And Hanley Page realized that there might be a way of solving this, and it's by if you can afford to make the wing thinner towards the tip, which is structurally favorable, you can sweep it less so that that then moves closer to the, the center of gravity in a longitudinal sense. And so that's the basis of their, their proposal for the crescent wing. They can make their wing very efficient structurally because it can taper in thickness. And actually, it has this property aerodynamically that it's less likely to stall outboard. So they, they start doing this. The one thing that it does mean 
is that you now don't have that longitudinal control. So your, your tailless aircraft now grows a tail because you need to provide the, the longitudinal control. So ultimately, out of this idea that they've been having during the war, they've managed to get well ahead of the game. They're discussing this tailless aircraft in 1946. When the requirement for the V-bombers comes out in 1947, they're ahead. They've got this concept that is will prove to be viable, but it already looks like it will work. So they're, they're, they're really well positioned. If we look at what Avro have been up to, they they ultimately start by, as you say, they've, they've got the Lancaster and they've got the Lincoln and they've been developing that. And they kind of think, well, if you put jet, jets on it, where does that lead us? I think the maximum dive speed of the Lancaster was about 360 miles per hour. So it's not going to get you very far. You're going to have to start again with an aircraft that's been stressed properly. And when they realize that they will need a swept wing aircraft to, to go any further, so they're going to have to start again. So both of these companies are looking in-house at what a jet bomber might be like. What really crystallizes these concepts is the actual issue of the specification B-3546 in January 1947. And it has this particular parameter in it, which is the aircraft can't be heavier than 100,000 pounds, which is not very heavy at all. So the B-47 in the United States, which is a contemporary of these designs, is probably about 50% heavier than Do we know with. why? Was that just something they, as the Air Ministry, tended to do, just threw a big number in and didn't really think about it? Or, or was there science behind the idea? I think the science behind the idea comes from the fact that, again, they wanted to use, as they had said with the Manchester 10 years before, we want to use the airfields that we have. And in the way that the V-bombers would deployed that actually made an amount of sense so i don't think they were particularly thinking of the numbers at the time but what would eventually happen is you had i think a force of 144 aircraft and they had to be dispersed in groups of four so you needed more than 30 airfields around the uk to make the idea work so actually although it sounds like can you just spend some more money on runways actually if you've got to spend some more money on 35 runways or 36 runways that's quite quite a big deal and even £100,000, which doesn't sound much now, that's a very big aircraft for 1946, where a Grand Slam Lancaster, I think, was £75,000 or so and that, as, as a heavy aircraft at the time. So the, there were not really the facilities to start to operate these aircraft from. So it made an amount of sense. <laughs> I'm going to use that. Yeah. An amount. So Avro Plate catch up here. Just for sake of argument, we're not going to talk about the Valiant because why? So... <laughs> Avro are playing a, a bit of catch up here and they start playing around with the concepts, I guess, that Hanley Page had been doing a few years before, don't they? So again, now you have this massive weight problem. Um, a tailless aircraft at Avro starts to look like a good idea as well. And, and again, it comes to, back to this pragmatism of, of Stuart Davis, where they think, well, we've got this swept tailless aircraft now and it's still proving very heavy. And the problem is, as you, if you have a, a significant degree of sweep, so they're talking about 45 um, degrees of sweep on a very long span wing. So the tips are quite a long way rearwards and that, that wing wants to twist quite a lot along its, along its span. And that means that structurally it has to be very heavy, very strong. And they think, well, what happens if we fill in the bit behind it and we it effectively braces itself then and it can be much lighter will that work and that also gives us the area that we need because the aircraft has to fly very high so again it's, it's a kind of a matter of record in, in Stuart Davis's writing where he says we didn't look at the aerodynamics of this we just thought well what if because that's something we could physically build and it would meet this spec so the delta comes more from prag pragmatism than anything else absolutely yeah yeah ultimately the Vulcan doesn't use most of the properties of either a slender delta or the, the kind of high angle of attack properties of a delta that we we would be familiar with now. It's, you know, it's just a way of providing a lot of wing with quite a lot of sweep at the amount of weight that they can afford. That's fascinating. You would assume that, chatting about the, the, the 707 test aircraft, that is sort of nice slender fightery looking aircraft, that that's kind of what they go for, but it's really, well, hang on a second, what if we just make this bigger? Does it make it lighter? Which again, you'd think is counterintuitive because you think bigger is, is heavier. But anyways, that's fascinating. Well, the thing that they can do is because the non-dimensional thickness, if you like, the percentage of how thick the aircraft, it, the, the wing is compared to how, compared to its cord, its leading edge to trailing edge dimension. So on the big triangle at, at the root, obviously the, the distance is tens of feet. 
So it can be tens of feet thick as well on the center line and still only be 10% thick. So I guess we need to mention this bit. You mentioned it before, because how far along in the development of, of Vulcan are they when Chadwick is killed in, in one of his own aircraft? Yeah, not, not very far at all. So it, it is in 1947 when Chadwick is killed in, in the Tudor 2 crash and uh, the specification is issued at, at the start. So there is a, a very well-known drawing that, that is attributed to, to Chadwick that shows effectively this triangular aeroplane with a bomb offset to one side that looks like the original concepts of the Vulcan. It has like tip fins, but ultimately it's a big triangle. So he was certainly deeply involved and um, Stuart Davis gives him the, the credit for not necessarily coming up with the concept because he didn't, but running with it and being willing to say, I am Roy Chadwick. I am, I am this designer at a very significant company. I'm going to do something outlandish. And that ultimately gets them the contract and ultimately we know it works, but it can't have been, it can't have been obvious but it would work. It, there was a huge amount of risk, but it, it is impressive. I think Davis was quite right to, to say this, that Chadwick was willing to you know, nail his colours to that mast and go for it. So you, you've got the what, what they're calling at the time, the 698, literally taking shape. So what does Davis have to overcome to get it into the air? And we're going to come, we're going to come back to the se- sexy kink in the wing later, but how do we get to B1, for example? So, so ultimately, they, they do design this effectively triangular aeroplane that looks like a, a flying wing. When the contracts are awarded, so it's towards the end of 1947, there obviously, it's not people in the MS3 saying, well, that looks nice. It's on the basis of advice that they've received from the Royal Aircraft Establishment and the RAF about what they want and what might be achievable on, on a scientific basis. So they've effectively, these concepts have been peer reviewed and effectively the people who know best in the land so the best scientific minds have looked at these things and said yeah that's um, the, the, day, the days of the designer obvious. having a quiet word with the man in the air ministry to get their pitch to the top of the pile are, are gone it's the air ministry turning to the, the boffins now and getting that review yeah they certainly need that information I, th- I mean there is still definitely a lot of walking the corridors of whitehall that's been done by george edwards and, and hanley page and from avro that's that's happening but you can't just slip it under the door. This is this is serious stuff to build something that will do 500 knots at 50,000 feet. People haven't really been there. The fighters that the RAF are flying at the time, I would think something like Mach 0.75, Mach 0.8 is the safest speed you can fly these aircraft, and they've got an endurance of an hour. We're talking about flying close to Mach 0.9, much higher than these aircraft, and to do that for hours and hours and end. Now, no one's ever built an airplane that will will do this, you know, your mate's aeroplane. It's, it's got to be something that, that is going to work. So the might of the Royal Aircraft Establishment and the best tech, technology is, is brought to bear to, to analyse whether, whether these designs should work. But it rapidly becomes obvious that in the forms that they've been submitted, they need a lot of development, both the, the Hanley page and the, the Avro concepts. And the first thing that becomes obvious is that the wing that has been specified is just too thick and you cannot fit everything that Avro have projected to fit into the fuse in, into the wing and, and have it be thin enough. So the Vulcan rapidly grows a, a forward fuselage, if nothing else. And the bomb bay on the center starts to look more like a fuselage region because the outboard wing has to get thinner. It still has these big um, circular pito inlets for much of the initial concept. But again, that's a change because there's information from Germany that says, actually, if you've got buried engines in your wing, what you really want to avoid is the ISA bars unsweeping themselves as they go through the center line of the fuselage. And you can start to use the engine installation in combination with moving the thickness far forward on the center line. You can use that to actually make your aircraft go faster. So you're saying rather than the engines being parasitic, you're actually integrating them into the design and that starts to make sense and solve some of the problems you would otherwise find around the route. So you start to get these initially rectangular inlets, but then the inlet that we're familiar with now on the Vulcan with the the thickness in that region moved very far forward as well. And so the isobars in that region are extremely swept. That's really, again, is avoiding the problems to a much higher bark number. So that's why we see the the buried engines in Vulcan Victor Comet, everybody making the best of of what they have, I guess, because... They're trying to get maximum power out of engines that at you know late 40s are are not that don't have that much oomph, do they? 
Yeah, indeed. I mean, the engines themselves are not, not very big at the time because we're not talking about engines with any sort of bypass ratio. We're not talking about turbo fans. So it's this sort of sweet spot in history where you can viably bury an engine because it's not going to be too thick to put in the wing, but any, any larger diameter of engine, and it stops making sense. So almost at the end of the V-bomber development, so when you've got things like Conway, they're starting to be constrained in terms of their bypass ratio by certainly in the Victor, you would go for a bigger bypass ratio if you could, probably. Um, the VC-10 with a very similar engine had a larger bypass ratio because it could put it on the outside of the aircraft. Yeah, so that starts to be a problem. Okay, so that digression aside, back to the development. So indeed, are you trying to sweep the isobars inboard significantly? That knowledge of that kind of three-dimensional movement of the thickness through the span of the wing, that, that is a particularly Royal Aircraft Establishment thing. So that's being understood there. And then that applies to... To Avro, so they've actually got quite a way along the process. So we're now talking about 1949-ish. They're about to start cutting metal in the prototype, and they delay that because they need to incorporate these big changes to the the wing span-wise design from the by the by the IRE. And again, Stuart Davis is looking at this and thinking, we can't not do this, and he's finding ways of making it happen. In this, I think it probably appeals to him in general the the simplicity of the, the Delta layout. So. One of the things that happens when the aircraft start flying is that the Victor, it will the, the, the prototype will be lost because its tailplane falls off. It sounds you know, almost um, flippant to say, but the, the Vulcan doesn't have a tailplane. So no one else has, has, no one at Avro has to go to the trouble and spend the time of designing a tailplane that won't fall off because the, the layout doesn't need one. It might not be the absolute optimum layout, but you've got to get an aircraft into service in a sensible amount of time. The Vulcan always ends up ahead of the Victor in service. And even if it's only 18 months, which it ends up being, who's to say at the time in this extremely volatile world that that wasn't the difference between the deterrent working and the deterrent not working? Yeah, so we were talking about the aerodynamics, weren't we? Think so perhaps back to that. But certainly the Vulcan starts off with this, or in its developed sense, the, the B1. It has this um, largely the RE, again, specify or suggest that tip stall can be alleviated by using a, a different section, different wing section towards the tip. So it goes down to 8% ultimately. But the prototype has built has this wing that looks pretty triangular. The rest of the Vulcan looks as we would recognize it, but it's, it's they've got this very triangular wing. And what happens as they manage to put bigger engines into the aircraft, the Olympus isn't ready, so it starts flying with Avons. And by the time the Olympus goes in the aircraft, they find that as the aircraft goes to its uh, close to its operational condition, so it's flying high and it's flying at a high Mach number, the wing starts to vibrate outboard. And this is a, for a number of reasons. One of them is that it will induce fatigue, so the aircraft's life will be very low. But the other more pragmatic one, or, or more important one, I guess, to the RAF, is that if the aircraft is vibrating, then it's not necessarily going to be dropping the bomb in the right place. So that becomes quite quite a significant issue. There's a, there's a quote from Tony Blackman, the, the Avro test pilot at the time, who's come from the RAF, and he's saying the aircraft will be no use as a bomber unless we, we fix this. So this is a major problem because the aircraft physically exists and they've started building them in, in production. So they need a fix that is, again, keep using the word pragmatic, but that's, it needs to be applicable, needs to be retrofitable to, to aircraft that already exist. And so the Royal Aircraft Establishment is brought to bear and there's a, an engineer there, Ken Newby, who's given this task of going in and developing an aerodynamic solution to the problem. And his first problem, first problem is understanding what he can do to actually find the problem in the wind tunnel. Because on the aircraft, built out of light alloy structure, and it's a very flexible thing. In a wind tunnel, you have a very solid model because you want to know that all the, the forces that you are measuring and the deflections you are measuring are to do with the air, and not the model itself. So that's a reason why that this buffet has never been detected in, in the wind tunnel. So he suggests that actually, if he measures the pressure at the trailing edge at the most loaded section of the wing, which turns out to be... I think it's 83% outboard. He can equate any separation he finds there to the probable onset of this buffeting. So that's the aerodynamic cause. He can't say that he's found that buffeting itself has been fixed, but he, if he can identify that the flow separation is occurring in the tunnel, then he can go away and fix that. And then hopefully it will fix the buffeting problem on the aircraft. And ultimately he does it by this method of extending and, and drooping the leading edge. And, and often I think that, that it's, the extension is seen as the important thing. But from an aerodynamic perspective, what he actually does 
is he exploits some knowledge that's being undertaken at the National Physical Laboratory at the time to try and understand this problem of how you don't lose enormous amounts of pressure across a shot wave. As the wing becomes more loaded, so as there's, there's a greater amount of suction on it, it has to recover a greater amount of suction to get back to the free stream conditions of the, of the training edge. And the strength of the shot wave is related to how loaded the wing is and this suction peak at the leading edge. And what's realized by an engineer called Piercy at the, at the MPL is that there's more than one way of decelerating the air. So the shot wave will occur, but it could be that the air could be slowed down to start with by a different mechanism, a, a reflection of the expansion waves that are emanating from the leading edge. Uh, and it will reflect them on the boundary between the supersonic flow that's over the wing and the subsonic flow that's existing ahead and behind it. So it's this big chunk of insight that's come from MPL into a physical mechanism that wasn't really suspected before. And ultimately, that is applied to the wing. And it, it's not really the extension that is the important bit. He has to extend it because he needs to get ahead of the wing and correctly align it. And he has to provide a different section at the leading edge. So it's quite a thin radius compared to what has been used previously. But using that knowledge, he goes ahead and applies it and it produces this section that effectively cures the buffet. But in doing so, it's the first, I think, the first application of this um, technique of supersonic expansion and then isentropic compression that is used routinely in subsonic aircraft design now. So every airliner that's been built since the 1960s will use this physical technique and aircraft like the Harrier, for example, on both its intakes and its wings will, will have used this. So combat aircraft that have been designed at the time as well. But this is the first time it's ever used and ultimately it fixes the Vulcan. So the Vulcan is often seen as a less advanced aerodynamic solution than the Victor, which conceptually it is but actually it has this section built into it almost accidentally in the end. It was a, a fix that is probably the single most advanced aerodynamic feature of any of the V-bombers. And, and, and again, it's just, uh, it's playing with physics, isn't it? You look at it now and I've got a little picture of, picture of it up now and it's, it, it looks really nice because it's the straight tin triangle is nice, but that little curve is, is very, oh, so that's aesthetics get the physics to do what you want and to be able to do that on something that's already in production that isn't going to completely muck everything up as well. And then to have the, the long life that you said, that's just absolutely fascinating. And you wouldn't think that something like that was figured out on, on Vulcan, would you? Because it's just the Vulcan, whereas these little subtleties and the changes in, in the wing, because I guess we're, we're not used to seeing, you know, see pictures of the straight wing, but the, the, curv the curvy one is the one we're kind of used to. So we just sort of think it's always been like that. And it just looks really good. I'm going to keep going back to aesthetics because that's the bit I understand. The rest of it just goes racing, racing over my head. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask about my, my favorite bit of a Vulcan lore is the Farnborough role. So you've got this big futuristic bomber showing up at, the greatest trade show known to man in, in the 50s. And the test pilot decides to treat it like a fighter, which upsets just about everybody. So I guess the question is, is that surmise correct? Or did it not happen? Because there are some people who say it doesn't even know we, we've got film of it because there's, you know, boring people out there that don't like excitement. No, it certainly happened. It was it was routine for a while. That's how they, they would fly the Vulcan and how they would sell it. And I, I think it's, it's not... I, th I think it's kind of come to be interesting because the Vulcan survived so long so that you and I have seen it and it's a 1950s aircraft but I, it wasn't unique to the Vulcan at the time that is what you would go and do at Farnborough I think it was very much an area of daring do wasn't it I mean the example is that the the Vulcan first went to Farnborough in 1952, just a few weeks after it had flown, and it did roll, and they, they did demonstrate it in the you know the, the best possible way. But at, famously at that show, the um, de Havilland's prototype of the DH-110 exploded and killed a large number of people, and the show went on. You know, it's, it it was it was a different and world. Not wanting to bring hawkers into this again, but Neville Duke literally used to live down the road from me here in, in Horsham, 
And he famously took a hunter up like an hour after Jeff de Havilland was killed and then broke the sandbag. I, I understood that he was literally yeah. waiting. I think he was the next, you know, the next item to, to fly. And, you know, he famously said, you know, almost he'd have done it yeah. for me or, you know, that's what he would have wanted. That air show is, you know, it's tragic, but the, the aircraft that are there, you, you've got, you know, you've got the plane spotters wet dreams. I mean, you've, you've got experiments with the Havilland aircraft. Tragically, you've got Hunter, which is just entering service. You've got the Vulcan there making its its debut. I suppose to wrap yourself in the red, white, and blue for a moment, everything must have seemed very, very shiny for the future of, of British aircraft in, in, in the early 50s, because you're seeing stuff that would have been in Buck Rogers 10 years before. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've got, so you have bombers and they fly like fighters might have flown the year before almost. There's no comparison, is there, between the bombers of five years before, the Lancaster and the Halifax, and the Vulcan and the Valiant that are there. But also on the ground, you've got, obviously, you've got the Comet, which is, you too can do this. You know, it's, it's The only people who are going to fly are going to be government officials and film stars, but there's a feeling that actually you could go in that aircraft and, and it will work. And not only that, but we will sell them everywhere. So the country is bankrupt and what we need are dollars coming in. And this is the way in which we will do it. We will demonstrate our, we will keep ourselves safe. And that's a, that's an overriding thing I think you get from reading opinions at the time. There isn't much discussion about whether whether having atomic weapons is a good idea once we've decided. It's obvious that that's what you should do. You need to defend yourself against people just over the way because 10 years earlier, they might have crossed the channel. So there's that. And there's the, the, the military might is important and the, it's, it's largely backed by the public given their recent experience. But the fact that this is this is the technology of the future. This is going to make us money and we need to show the world what we are doing. But also look at it. It's, it does have Union Jacks all over it. It's amazing. And then the next thing that happens is its role changes. It's ba- barely in service, and it's it goes. Is it five five years or something? And it goes from a high altitude, sort of conventional nuclear bomber, into a low level role because air defences have gotten better, SAMs have gotten better, and the Vulcan still can do it. And it's showing the, the sort of the I guess the the depth of the design to be able to cope with that change in role. Yeah, again, I, and obviously I wave the Vulcan flag a lot. And I'm, I'm, it'd be brilliant to claim that this was all part of the plan. But actually, again, we sort of pragmatically looked into an aircraft that could fly in a low-level environment despite being designed to fly at 50,000 feet. And again, and they didn't consider this at the time, I don't think, at all. But it's one of the properties of the Delta that it made it possible to do so for the Vulcan, but not really for the Victor, about a low-aspect ratio wing is that you are effectively the, the lift over that wing is suppressed by the effect of the tips and the the trailing vortices that you have so what it doesn't do is gain lift as quickly as a high aspect ratio wing as the angle of attack increases if you're flying at low level you're flying in a gusty environment and although you might not be commanding angle of attack increases you're certainly finding them very quickly because the gusts are causing the flow over the wing to become, or the onset flow to the wing to be unsteady. And the question is, how does the aircraft respond to that? And for the Vulcan, that response was very damped. If you like, the gradient by which it gained lift with those changes of angle attack was low. For the Victor, doing exactly the same thing in exactly the same conditions, its wing gained much more lift under the same gusts. So the Victor was constantly trying to climb or, or dive its wing would have been cyclically loaded, which is the cause of fatigue. And also, given, just given the, the, the increase of span of the, the Victor wing compared to the Vulcan, you know, you've got the, the effect of the root of that wing would have been very significant. Exhaust, exhausting for the crew as well. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So it was no, no fun for the crew, but for the aircraft itself, like burning through the fatigue life. So as I say, I don't think it was ever considered by everyone when they were designing it, but it's just this, this sort of lucky thing that, that occurred. And even for the RAF, they didn't consider that beyond 1970 they would be flying the Vulcan and in fact they were obviously still flying it in 1982 in a combat role so yeah it, it did the job yeah we won't talk about Falk. I'll, I'll save that for a couple of months and see if I can convince Bob Tuxford to come on to to give his version of the story which is my favorite way to look at Black Buck from the the, the cockpit of the Victor tankers because he's, he's great fun but that's that's a story for another day 
let's start to wrap things up and let's talk about well let's talk about your vulcan show and, and what's hap happening with her now and operation safeguard which is your big plans for the future yeah so uh, i mean as you may know we we operated successfully from what was our if in Ingley, what is now Doncaster Sheffield Airport for, for kind of the second half of the, the flying program. And we had to stop flying at the end of, of 2015. And our plan at the time was to ultimately move to our own hangar as an attraction, but certainly at the time to, to remain within Hangar 3, which is where we've been based. We set ourselves up to make the aircraft very accessible. And we had a, an interesting, effectively, museum around the aircraft. So with lots of artifacts, lots of people who wanted to come. And that was really successful. But basically, the, the growth at the airport meant that we ultimately had to move out of, of Hangar 3. And unfortunately, since 2017, the aircraft has been largely outside, but still fully operational. And we can get a limited number of people down to see the aircraft do our do our engine runs, but effectively it's limited because we're airside and it's a complicated mm. procedure to get people airside at the airport. And um, ultimately the airport have been have been very good, been very accommodating and that they have looked after us, but it's not where we want to be. We want the aircraft to be undercover, to be safe for the long term. We want the, the large numbers of people who do want to come and see the aircraft, we want them to be able to come and do that. So our plan is to build our own dedicated hangar on a site that's been earmarked at the airport to do that. And unfortunately, there's a, there's a cost to that, which is something like £4.6 million that will be the cost of the project. And at the moment, we've launched Operation Safeguard, as you've mentioned, which is effectively a way of funding the first part of, of that project. So we are encouraging people to get their name on the aircraft through their donation and ultimately we should be able to open this facility in which the Vulcan is, is central and the facility pays for itself. We keep 558 safe. But as part of that, we want to talk about the technology that was in the Vulcan and how that has inspired things since. So we've mentioned in our discussion about how the advanced wing sectional technology was applicable to making subsonic aircraft efficient. And there's obviously a huge amount of work that's going on at the moment to green air travel is a good way of telling that story. We can get that discussion going within that facility. We can show things that are interesting. We can show what the solutions are. And we can inspire people both to, I guess, feel better about flying because the solutions are there, but to get involved in engineering. And so at the moment, we're also working with the University Technical College in Doncaster to do projects around the Vulcan. And the, the students there are very enthusiastic about that kind of thing. So we can see there's an enormous potential for the aircraft to, to continue to be inspiring and make a difference in the future but we've got to deliver it and we've got to deliver it quickly so where can people go to learn more find out what they can do to help? Give, it, give it all a plug so the quickest place to go is our website vulcantothesky.org but you can find us on facebook or you can find us on linkedin or you can find us on twitter all the usual places just look at vulcan to the sky or xh558 fantastic so there you go people you know what to do now um, i can hear lunch being made in the other room so i think it's time to start wrapping this up steve this has been fantastic and i i can now explain transonic slightly better the next time i have to talk about flutter and before i move on very quickly from from all of that thank you so much not at all thank you for having me it's, it's been great i've been enjoying listening to the, to the previous episodes to to be involved it is really good thank you fantastic and we shall get your cartoon over to you shortly as well that's 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 the <laughs> <laughs> that's the best bit that's why i'm here oh yeah that's, that's the only reason anyone yeah. wants to come on this show fantastic and cryptically all the best for 2022 <laughs> on the day job <laughs> thank you thank you <laughs> Super. Steve, thank you so much. And everybody, thank you so much for listening. We'll be back soon. Bye.